Hello class, I'm Professor Dwight Hughes, and this is CCNA Security for Clark College, course Intech 225. This is the lecture on Chapter 1, Modern Network Security Threats. We'll look at securing networks, we'll look at network threats, mitigating those threats, and a quick summary. We have two objectives. We want to be able to describe the current network security landscape and explain how all types of networks need to be protected. Current state of affairs. This is the website, and there's several of these, where you can watch uh, cyber attacks happening in real time. You have a lab in class where you're going to go to this, uh, this site and actually observe some real time uh, hacking and um, other cyber crimes occurring in real time. So it's kind of fascinating to see that it's going on all around us and all around the world. You can see here that there are certain epicenters, certain targets, if you will, that are more popular throughout the world than others. Drivers for network security. The common security terms that you'll need to become familiar with will be threat, vulnerability, mitigation, and risk. Threat, that's any, uh, any kind of threat that might uh, threaten your data or your infrastructure, something like that. A vulnerability is, of course, a weakness in that data, like not encrypted, or your infrastructure, like don't have a firewall. And then mitigation means to lessen. So we can never really eliminate threats. We might be able to eliminate a specific threat, but threats will always be there. What we can do, though, is mitigate our risk. So mitigation is lessening. So maybe adding a firewall or doing 24 seven monitoring. Those will help us lessen the damage from a threat. And then risk is an assessment of how vulnerable you are to a particular threat. So your level of risk. So for instance, if you have data that's just uh, maybe a paper for school, for this class perhaps, as a lab activity, you really probably don't need to encrypt it and go to extreme measures to keep it protected. But if the data is more valuable, you know, has social security information, uh, private information, uh, credit cards, then it probably is at higher risk of uh, falling into the wrong hands. Vectors of network attacks. So essentially there's two types. They can come from external threats or from internal. External threats would be anywhere in the world. Anonymous um, hackers trying to break in and compromise your systems or data. You also have internal threats within a company. That would be your own employees. Sometimes unwittingly. They're not always intentionally attacking, but they may have a computer that's infected with malware. They may have picked up a thumb drive out in the parking lot and brought it in and plugged it into their computer, thinking, sweet. I got a free thumb drive, and on there is a Trojan horse, a little gift, some malware to raid your network. So internal threats are probably the hardest for us to prevent because we have to trust our internal systems to some degree, or they wouldn't be able to do the business of the, of the day. Uh, we can much more successfully protect ourselves from external threats. Data loss. You know, email, webmail, unencrypted devices. You know, if you've got a USB um, flash drive or an external hard drive or a laptop and it falls into the wrong hands, all that data could be compromised if it's unencrypted. Also, if someone gets a hold of your email account, your webmail account, they uh, brute force your password, they gain access to that. What's in there? You know, how, how important is that data to keep it secured? Cloud storage is inherently insecure. A lot of security risks with uh, storing things in the cloud. Students sometimes use Dropbox and OneDrive and different types of cloud storage. Uh, most of those are, are pretty insecure. Uh, of course, we mentioned removable media. Hard copy is anything printed out. Where, where are those stored? Where do they end up? And improper access control. You know, So access control is, is usually related to the physical building, locked doors and um, you know, locks on things, 
and uh, even passwords would be access control. And sometimes if they're improper, if we have if the password's password or we leave the doors unlocked and unmonitored, we're just asking for trouble. Let's do a network topology overview. And this would be a, a basic campus area network. So you can see we've got three devices kind of protecting the network here. On the left, you've got a VPN, which is of course, uh, creating encrypted tunnels in and out of the company, allowing folks outside to get in securely. We are also running a firewall, which is blocking certain ports and monitoring IPs and looking at things. And then we have a, a device that we're gonna study more in this class called IPS, an intrusion prevention system. And that's similar to if you've had a credit card that does this when your spending habits suddenly change, perhaps the credit company calls you and says, hey, uh, we're gonna suspend your card until you get back to us and tell me that those, those new types of charges are, are okay. So IPS software is similar. It does a baseline fingerprint of your network traffic. And when it deviates too much from that fingerprint, it can shut it down and then alert you that you've had an anomaly in the traffic. And then you can usually, through an app on your phone, uh, reauthorize the traffic if that, you know, if that was an error. So with IPS software, it's about just adjusting and tuning it to um, you know, fit the parameters of your network. In a small office network, you don't have all that. You've got a wireless router. That's also your firewall. That's also your VPN. That's doing it all. And you won't be able to benefit primarily from IPS. You just can't afford it. It's a small office, home office, one, two, five users. So one to five users is, is really not going to be um, the type of network that, that's going to be as easy to secure. So we're going to try to keep less, um, less critical information on there. Wide area networks. So we can do wide area networks. They can be a leased line. You studied those uh, perhaps in your Cisco 4 class if you've taken that yet. Uh, they can be a VPN. They can be across a phone line. A variety of different ways we can build a wide area network. And depending on which way we do the wide area network, we might need more or less encryption and security. Generally, we always want to encrypt everything. Then we need a data center. We need a centralized place where we can lock up our data and keep it secure. So you're going to have to have outside perimeter security. That's your physical security outside the data center. That means out in the parking lots, the fences, the gates, the front door of the building. You should have video surveillance, alarms, and security guards, fences, and gates. Inside your data center, you want to have electronic monitoring, video surveillance, motion detectors. You want to have some type of a um, door access system. Biometric would be like fingerprint or an eye retina scan, or it could just be a keypad or a um, magnetic card. Cloud and virtual networks. They're also vulnerable to a variety of attacks. Many servers today are running as a virtual device and not a physical server. Your VM could be hijacked. It could uh, fall prey to an antivirus storm and it could have all kinds of uh, other attacks against it. That's an emerging threat area is virtual networks. Uh, secure data center is going to be segmented. We've talked about segmentation in other classes, like segmenting the broadcast domain, segmenting the collision domain. So the more you have your network segmented or compartmentalized, the safer it is. Because if one compartment becomes compromised, it will you know, mitigate the effect on, on the rest of your network. You should have a threat defense system. So these would be you know, things like firewalls and uh, network monitoring software, things like IPS, the intrusion prevention systems. And you need some visibility in network monitoring software, things like that. Okay, the evolving network border, it's disappearing, it's expanding. No one knows where it is, right? Because it used to be the network started when you walked in the company building, but now with bring your own device, People were carrying around the network on their own smartphones, on their laptops, on their home computers. So the network is extended all over the place. So we need to make sure the data is encrypted where it's stored and when it's transferred. And we need to have um, more frequent changes of passwords and adding pins 
pin is a, a short code that you would enter in addition to a password. We need to do data wipes on devices. Um, that's to make sure that data is no longer on the device when we say repurpose a device to another area. And we need to do all kinds of other things listed there and beyond. Let's move on to network threats. So after we complete this section, you should be able to describe the evolution of a network um, security network and describe the various types of attack tools used by hackers. Many of those tools, by the way, are also used by network administrators. You should be able to describe malware, what is malware, and explain common network attacks. Who's hacking our networks? Well, hackers fall generally into these five uh, categories. Script kiddies, vulnerability brokers, right? So is script kiddies a pretty unaware, unaccomplished, call it an amateur, doesn't really know what they're doing. They downloaded some software off the internet. They click next, 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 and that software really attacked your network, not the uh, person. There was no skill really involved or little skill involved with script kitty attacks. Uh, vulnerability brokers prey on a particular vulnerability of a particular system or piece of software. So they can only attack in very limited ways. They, they have pretty good knowledge about their particular vulnerability that they exploit but they cannot exploit any vulnerability. They only know, they're like a one trick pony. They know one thing. Hacktivists, which are your amateur hackers, and this is probably your largest group. Hacktivists are um, not always motivated by money. They, they typically do it for revenge or fun or various uh, reasons, but they're just uh, an amateur hacker breaking into people's networks and causing mayhem. Then you have cyber criminals who are definitely motivated by money. Uh, they often are behind things like ransomware where they will hold your data at ransom until you pay a fee to get it back. And they're often related to large criminal organizations throughout the world. Then we finally have state-sponsored hackers, which would be you know, like our own NSA, the National Security Administration, which is essentially a hacking operation. And we have uh, those throughout the world. You know, Israel's got them, China, Russia, even Iran. Everybody seems to have a state-sponsored hacking group. And they go around and hack each other's government systems and primarily leave most of us alone. There's also some hats. Hackers like to call themselves either white hat, gray hat, or black hat hackers. A black hat is up to no good. A white hat is hacking for good. So they're often um, employed, white hat hackers are employed helping defend against black hat hackers. And then gray hat's kind of in the middle. They, you know, they, they do good, you know, they're kind of like a Robin Hood, right? They do good things, but not everything they do may be legal. Hacker tools. All right. So when hacker tools first came out, oh, let me go back here. When hacker tools first came out, they required a lot of technical knowledge to be able to um, use them. There were very few tools. Most were command line, think DOS, and you had to have a lot of expertise to be able to get the tool to do anything. So not a big problem really until now in 2015, we've reversed the tide. We have slick, gooey attack tools that you can download that are very sophisticated, but you don't have to know much to use them. You just open a wizard in the tool, click next, 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 and it runs the attack for you. So we've kind of got a big problem where the software is really doing the hacking for the human without the human having to have much knowledge of what's even going on. Making almost anybody a hacker if they download the right software. Evolution of security tools. These are some of the different types of penetration testing tools uh, that we have. And this is where I would say these are used by hackers, but they're also used by network administrators. Penetration testing is the um, idea of figuring out where the weaknesses in your network are. Of course, hackers would want to know that. So they would use these tools to find your weaknesses, your vulnerabilities. Also, network admins would like to know what their vulnerabilities are, and they employ some of these same tools uh, to look at that. 
So with encryption, we'd be talking about looking at what type of encryption is used. Different types of encryption can be cracked and have different vulnerabilities. So um, understanding what type of encryption a company is using could be helpful. Different categories of attacks. So eavesdropping, data, mo data modification, IP address spoofing, that would be pretending you're someone else's IP address. Could be any kind of password-based attack where you're, you're trying to break into someone's password, guess their password, do different things. Could be denial of service where you're trying to prevent people from using their own systems. Man in the middle where you interject yourself in the middle of a data flow and pretend to be one end of it and uh, are receiving the data even though you're not one of the ends. Compromise key where you get a hold of a key that unlocks or um, validates data and then you can use that key um, you know, for wrong purposes. And a sniffer which we in our Cisco classes use Wireshark and Wireshark is a passive sniffer and there are um, passive and active sniffers and they help you determine uh, what devices are on the network and what they're doing. And so that's what we would call a reconnaissance attack would be using a sniffer tool. Let's look at malware. Types of malware. Viruses. Wow, who wants a virus, right? Viruses by their nature generally spread. That's their main intent is to duplicate themselves and move across your network and through the machines. Viruses may cause harm. Some viruses um, don't actually do anything bad. Some do different degrees of bad things. Some will destroy your computer. Trojan horse. Trojan horse, you know, that's like the, um, the famous Trojan horse, which had the Roman soldiers inside uh, in the Battle of Troy. The Trojan horse classification means that you've got some nasty software disguised as pretty good legitimate software. The example that was floating around some years ago, there was a screensaver for a fish aquarium that was actually a Trojan horse for malware. So someone had written a screensaver and they had packed malware in it. And this is done very commonly. You'll see this with uh, your iPhone and Android apps. You'll occasionally hear about apps that got pulled from the app store because they had malware hidden inside. Those are, um, or spyware or adware, or different types of um, harmful software that is hidden inside of legitimate software. Okay. This is showing how a worm propagates. In 19 hours, the top Top uh, illustration is hour zero, and on the bottom, that's 19 hours later, you can see how the code red worm moved throughout the world. It's pretty staggering what, at less than a day, it moved throughout the world. And as you may know with these things, they pick up momentum because it's exponential growth. One copies itself to all the systems around it. Those copies copy themselves to all the systems around it. It's staggering. Okay, components of a worm. You'd have some kind of enabling vulnerability, something that takes advantage of vulnerable systems. So you have to find out what system is vulnerable in what way. So maybe it's a particular version of Windows operating system has a particular vulnerability and you write a worm to take advantage of that. Then you need a way for the worm to move, to propagate, to um, reproduce itself to other vulnerable systems and non-vulnerable. Sometimes the worms will lay dormant on a non-vulnerable system, maybe a Mac or something of that nature. And they're on there and they're carried around and they just lie in wait until they're copied onto a vulnerable system. And then they have some type of payload. That's the, uh, the harmful piece or the spy piece. Uh, the worm has something it does once it gets inside a vulnerable system. Okay, other malware. Ransomware, that's in the news all the time. People's systems being hijacked and then sold back to them for, uh, for ransom. Spyware, where someone's looking at what you're doing or recording what you're doing. That's, uh, you know, uh, tied to identity theft and all kinds of bad things. Adware, where ads come up and you can't make them go away. Uh, some people have had that where they open their web browser and it keeps going to the same advertisements. Um, Scareware, you may have had these messages pop up on your computer that says your computer is infected, click here. 
and you click there and it installs the malware. Your computer wasn't infected. It was it was a fake scareware, but they scared you into clicking. Phishing, phishing is trying to extract information through various means, trying to find out, like trying to get you, I might send you an email that asks you for your password, but I dupe you into thinking I am a trusted uh, IT person from your own company and that you should provide that password. That would be a phishing attack. Uh, root kits um, are something that you can employ to get the password um, out of vulnerable operating systems and different things. So a root kit is a way to get around the security of an operating system. Common network attacks. Let's take a look at reconnaissance access and DOS. Reconnaissance attacks. So the initial query of a target, you have to find a target in other words. So reconnaissance is, is like you might do, it's called casing the place. You go around and you look for vulnerable targets. One way you might do that is called a ping sweep. If you get the IP address of one device, you can derive what network it's in through some simple subnetting and anding. And then you could, with most software, there's many software tools that will do a ping sweep for you. And just you just enter the start and end IP address and it pings every IP in there and tells you which ones responded. You could then take the ones that responded and do additional reconnaissance on them. It will help you start narrowing down and identifying the players on the network. Where are the servers? Where are their IPs? Where are the routers? That kind of thing. So once you've found those targets, then you can run a port scan on those active IPs. So after the ping sweep tells you what IPs are active on the network, you can use port scan software to enter one of those IP addresses and it will scan every port starting at port one and port two. And so it will tell you what protocols are running. Gives you a good idea, like if the, uh, you know, if the um, HTTP protocol is running, then it might be a web server and that kind of thing. You can also use vulnerability scanners. There's, there's many of them. One's called Kane Enable. Um, that also could be classified as an exploitation tool. So be careful if you download and use Kane Enable. Um, software like that can be seen as destructive and you, you could get in trouble but it is also used to uh, identify the vulnerabilities. Access attacks. So an access attack is when they come in, right? First was reconnaissance. We didn't break into anything. We're just casing the place. We're snooping around, taking pictures, so to speak, right? Writing things down, recording information. Usually that is the precursor to an access attack. And you would do an access attack to get a hold of the data to gain access and to um, escalate those access privileges. Once you're in, you then try to get higher and higher levels of access, right? Once you're in the door, they can't get rid of you. You try to just keep working that um, entry point until you can gain higher and higher levels of access. So a few types of um, uh, access attacks would be something to do with getting your password. Now there's many ways to get the password. One's called brute force, where I just try every possible combination. Another's called social engineering, where I guess the password based on what I know about the user. Um, I can use trust exploitation, where I get you to trust me and then I have you tell me the password. Port redirection. Um, trust exploitation could also be at the device level with uh, one device uh, tricking the other into uh, thinking it is trusted. A man in the middle, like I said, you could get two folks, uh, two devices that are communicating on the network and you could inject yourself in the middle of that and take over as one of the two devices and gain information. You could do a buffer overflow. Weird things happen when you make the computer buffers overflow. IP Mac and DHCP spoofing, which is where you fake your IP, your MAC address or um, other DHCP settings. Social engineering. This is actually probably the most um, common type of hacktivist. So this would be the higher level attacks done by um, amateur and professional attackers, not by script kiddies and uh, those folks. It would be real serious hackers that are going to do these various attempts to get you to give them your information. They can do it through email, through phone calls. They show up in person. They write you letters in the mail. They just watch you with, uh, you know, with a camera or follow you around. Real creepy stuff. Denial of service attacks. Here, the objective is to prevent someone from accessing a service. 
and many times their own network. So you could have a whole bunch of machines ping the same place at one time, and that would make that place inaccessible to legitimate traffic. Often a denial of service attack is combined with um, some other attack, like an access attack to disguise it or to prevent those um, that could be able to block it from getting into their own network and blocking it. A DDoS is a distributed denial of service attack. That's what most DOS attacks are today is DDoS attacks. And you build a network of infected machines called bots that you can um, command to, and here they're calling them zombies, but bots are zombies, same thing. So they call it a botnet, and the members of the botnet are bots, or here they're going to call them uh, zombies. So then they're controlled by a handler system that instructs them all to attack a target. And there are networks now of over a million computers in one single network throughout the world that can be pointed at any target. And they, by the way, continue to, of course, scan and infect more targets while they're doing their work. And many people walk around with this uh, botnet software. Um, it's malware and it's installed on their computers and they don't know it because it's not attacking them. It's using their computer to attack others. It's just borrowing their CPU and their network to send attacks. And those would be an attack where it's just creating traffic. It just generates traffic. And if you get a million devices sending uh, requests all at once to a server, it's going to overload it and cause the server to either crash or at least become inaccessible to other legitimate uh, requests. Let's talk about finally mitigating these threats. How do we lessen our exposure to threats? When we're done with this section, you should be able to describe methods and resources to protect the networks that you are in charge of, describe a collection of domains for network security, explain the purpose of the Cisco SecureX architecture, describe the techniques used to mitigate common network attacks, and explain how to secure the three fundamental areas of Cisco routers and switches. Let's get started. Defending the network. Network security is a growing industry. It's growing rapidly. We call it an emerging industry. And there are some pretty sweet jobs. There's high level jobs like a CIO, six figure income kind of jobs, um, chief information officer, chief information security officer, or security operations. That would be a SecOps or OpSec um, manager. Those are all really great positions. And then you could also be um, a security manager, a security engineer, security technician, uh, security admin, all kinds of new jobs. These are just some. Just to highlight, there's a few uh, job openings out there in every town all over. And we live in a part of the country up in the Pacific Northwest where uh, we've got the uh, joint base and that's in charge of the cyber command for the civilian. Um, basically protecting companies throughout the country from cyber attack. And that's brought a lot of uh, businesses here. Um, so we have, you know, McAfee and we have um, a number of other companies that have located themselves in this region to take advantage of the uh, kind of synergy of network security professionals moving here. These are some of the network security organizations. Uh, SANS is a must visit site. I think every student should take a visit to the SANS website. It is really like a Wikipedia of network security. So they have all kinds of uh, papers on it. They have a threat database where you can look up different threats and you can uh, also link to many of these other sites are linked off of SANS. It's a primary job is education at SANS, by the way. This is called the CIA triad. I want you to envision a triangle here. Just superimpose a triangle on this. Um, in fact, if you look up CIA triad on Wikipedia, they use a simple triangle to illustrate it. And essentially, we're breaking the components of cryptography into three categories. Availability, confidentiality, and integrity. Right. So one is to ensure confidentiality, to hide, to encrypt, right? And one is the integrity. That's to make sure nothing was changed, that your data is unaltered. So we have 
um, other mechanisms like hash algorithms that uh, we run on a sequence of data and then we run it again when it arrives and if they match the data arrived intact if they don't match somehow it got modified during transit and then availability okay so this is just basically making sure that the data is available meaning it, it isn't uh, it isn't succumb to DDoS attacks or other types of attacks domains of network security So all the different kind of areas you might work in in uh, network security and in smaller companies you might be involved in many or all of these areas this is what network security is for a company so you have to at some level as a company address all of these um, areas you've got to have a policy before you get started with anything else you really should sit down with stakeholders in the company and figure out what kind of rules and policies you need to have you know how long should a password be good for how complex should a password be um, what's uh, what's the stance on people bringing uh, software from home and loading uh, work computers or how about putting information on those USB um, thumb flash drives those are all the types of things you have to look at in a network security policy you'll have a lab activity where you get to look at that And before you write the policy, you see these slides are almost backwards, right? So I say, okay, you gotta have a policy. Now we say, okay, well, you gotta have a policy, but don't do that yet. You've gotta have objectives for the policy. What's really important to your company? And then you write a policy to help protect that, right? What do you have that others may want? What's the really critical stuff that your company has? Is it intellectual property? Is it your customer records? What about your company is really the primo stuff that you need to protect? Okay, let's talk for a moment about Cisco Secure X architecture. This is basically an advertisement for Cisco. So a Secure X architecture is just a um, architecture. So it's not a thing, it's not a product it's a suite or group of products and not all of them are even made by Cisco it's a group of products that Cisco has pulled together into a solution and so uh, secure X is just a way when you ask for um, from a salesman you say hey I'd like to get a Cisco secure X solution they put that together for you by pulling from different things it would be like uh, the different packages available in an automobile right so that it would involve routers and switches and firewalls and all kinds of different devices and software packages all, all working towards uh, an intended goal whatever your company goal was okay this is this is a fun one here this is the artichoke of attack right and so this is showing the uh, different things each leaf of the artichoke we've already talked about all these but the different things that would be vulnerable so as you peel those back you get to more and more sensitive data so Hackers, what this is illustrating is hackers don't always go right for what they want. They try to worm their way in or chip. They're using the analogy chip their way in. Um, we talked about that earlier with access attacks. I try to, once I get in, I try to escalate my privileges to get in further and get in further um, to what I really want. I don't always try to attack the system I want initially. I may attack a different system. So this is why it can be frustrating. Attacks can seem to come out of the blue because they'll try to compromise an internal system. We talked about the difference between internal attacks and external and the internal are much harder to uh, protect against. So they'll try to first compromise a low level internal machine and then use that as an attack point within your network. This gives you an idea of the different categories under the umbrella of Secure X. Again, Secure X isn't a product. You can't go down to the store and buy it. It's not a thing. It is a solution. It is a product family. So there's just a whole bunch of stuff that you can combine together, kind of like building a house, right? Or um, uh, maybe, maybe uh, I don't know, what, whatever you might build or put together at dinner, right? So you could call Secure X dinner and you tell the salesman I want this type of dinner and they go through their product and they pull product for you and sell it to you and say this will create that dinner for you 
So it would involve things like scanning enger, engines, delivery mechanisms, intelligence, uh, software, management consoles, and endpoints that are next generation. Whatever all that means, those are just sales buzzwords. So this is something that you would want to have, right? So you want to have a security policy based on five parameters. So back to what you would go on your notes under security policy, you would say first you want to have some objectives for the policy, and then you want to make sure there's uh, five parameters. You know, what type of devices is being used for access? Um, what's the person's identity? What's the application in use? What's the location? What's the time of access? So those be kind of the, um, the things that you would want to be able to keep track of in terms of a security policy. We talked about IPS, intrusion prevention systems before. ASA is just a Cisco um, uh, product, which is uh, essentially a firewall VPN. So it does VPN firewall. And then there's other products here, all kind of put together to show you how it's not one thing. You can't do security with one lock on one door. Security is not locking one door, right? Um, you know, the Titanic was an unsinkable ship, so they didn't bother to put the life wraps on. The epic mistake there was relying on one level of defense. So you really want to have multiple levels of defense. And of course, uh, we have so much data and so many devices and so much going on today um, that we use management software, network management software to help us manage all of this. Common network threats. Okay, there at the top, written security policy. Best way to mitigate threats is to have a policy because if you don't have a policy, you don't have consistency, you don't know what's been done, what hasn't been done to what level. Control physical access, use strong passwords. These are just almost common sense things on this list. Use antivirus software, right? I visit a lot of companies that are smaller and their antivirus software hasn't been updated. They got it, but the subscription's expired. It's using old outdated uh, definitions um, or they don't even have it installed. Some servers, There'll be a, all the PCs will have antivirus software and you go to the server and they don't have antivirus software on the server. Um, so many people don't have antivirus software. And if they did, uh, you, you would have that in the policy. That would be in the policy that all systems will have antivirus, anti-malware software. Right? Right? You need a way to contain worms, right? So. You're going, um, going to have to quarantine and treat them or inoculate them, right? So it starts with containment because worms spread. So you want to get that system disconnected from the network quickly. Again, there's software that can help you do that. They'll literally log in the switch and kill the port that device is connected to. Uh, as soon as they identify the worm, they will shut it down. Mitigating reconnaissance attacks. You have to monitor your network. Right? You have to look at the logs. You have to use different tools. Then the attacker can't learn much and they usually move on to someone else's network because you're not sending interesting information. Okay, Strong passwords, all these good things. These are just some of the, there's an ASA 5505. That's what we'll be using in class. That's the top one and below it's a 5510. And then um, I don't know if that's a 5530 or 50 below it, but that, those are all ASAs. Here's an idea for building a network. You build it in three planes. You have the data plane, which is where packets are coming in and out on your network. And then you have a management plane, which is inaccessible from the other planes. See that? And then you have a control plane. We'll be talking more about that, but this is that idea of compartmentalizing your network. Auto secure is a Cisco command. You can type auto secure from the command line. If you go to global config, just type auto secure and it will actually go through and um, apply 10 security settings to your config automatically. 
So that's a, that's a way to, it'll go through and turn off unused. Uh, you want to do it after you've configured the device, of course. It'll go through and turn off uh, a lot of the ports and services that you're not using, and it will um, you know, in, enforce some uh, security. So that's one we'll be reading about in class is the auto secure command and how to use that as a kind of uh, idiot's way to start with security. It's kind of a quick, easy way to throw a little bit of security on. Um, and if you don't have a lot of time, um, it's, it's a great way to do it and should always be probably the first thing you do when you're done with the config is to apply auto secure. We're going to use SSH and HTTPS to manage our devices to make sure we have encrypted communications. <coughs> we'll use role-based access control instead of a one-size-fits-all password. You know, so in our Cisco classes, we often are using just a single password that would be shared among multiple people. Here, what you would do is you would create different roles like administrator, technician, um, monitor, uh, you know, guest, whatever kind of roles you want, and you would uh, assign uh, individual accounts to those roles so they get different levels of, of access. Okay. We're going to use access control lists. You learn those in Cisco 2, and we'll use um, some layer 2 security, port security, DHCP snooping, um, ARP inspection. These will all cut down on some of the hacking threats that we see on the data plane. The data plane is going to be the, the most hacked, right? That's going to be the one closest to the packets coming in and out. So that'll really be the, uh, the one that is most vulnerable. All right, in summary, in this long chapter, we explain network security, what it is. We describe the various types of threats and attacks, and we explain the tools and procedures to mitigate the effects of malware and common network attacks.